We are live streaming in three, two, one, action. Good evening. Tonight is Wednesday, December 15th, and this is the Hendrick Hudson School Board of Education's last public meeting for 2021. Can we start with the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm just to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, other God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, the board has just completed their presentation. Never mind that they must go through the agenda. Can I get a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Does anybody have anything they want to pull for the consent agenda? Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as stated? Can I get a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That will bring us to our items removed from the consent agenda. This is usually a very nice section of the meeting because we often find donations. And tonight we do have two donations that are pulled from the consent agenda. One is a donation totaling $945 from the HHCEF to cover a portion of the brick um, ball, the, the, um, the memorial wall, tribute wall, that's, that's the word I'm looking for, the tribute wall <laughs> that needs to be repaired. So thank you to the HHCF for maintaining this wall. It's a really lovely tribute wall. You haven't seen that there are names embossed all around. And the other donation we have this evening is a donation for $500 from Christine Schuster. Um, through the Bank of America Charitable Foundation, and that goes to benefit the students at the Blue Mountain Middle School. So thank you very much to Christine and Bank of America. Can I get a motion to approve those two donations? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 That will now bring us to our superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. Uh, two updates. First is uh, our monthly update regarding uh, preparations to implement the Princeton plan, uh, otherwise known as grade level banding. As the board knows, and certainly the, the community should know, that uh, we are moving to a different elementary organization next year where uh, Frank G. Lindsay will house our district's kindergarten and first graders. Buchanan for Plank Elementary School will house our second and third, and Furnace Woods will house our fourth and fifth grade. Uh, this is a very big endeavor and initiative, and uh, we've committed to providing community updates monthly. After tonight's discussion, we'll update our website, our dedicated webpage, to um, uh, communicating with the public around uh, our transition activities and timeline and such. So I want to give you, want to touch on a, a couple major points and then uh, certainly entertain questions. So uh, the first big piece of planning for this move is preparing to move. Uh, we have a number of teachers that will be moving from one school to another. And we may have teachers who are not physically moving schools that will be moving uh, potentially within the school building. Why is that? Because uh, if I'm a kindergarten teacher at Frank G. Lindsay and I will remain a kindergarten teacher next year, um, that classroom may or may not be part of a kindergarten wing, uh, depending on uh, discussion with the prospective principal and their staff. So um, everyone may move. Uh, we certainly want to limit that, but uh, at least two thirds of our teachers will be moving from one school to the next. And so that process has begun. We've ordered boxes. We have provided them to teachers so they can uh, begin to pack as they wish. Uh, Anthony Merlini and, and the team of head custodians are identifying different times uh, and milestones throughout our school district where uh, if teachers want to um, have some of their boxes uh, moved from their classroom to either a holding uh, a holding facility, facility would be in the school. Uh, ultimately, Anthony and his team would then move them to the school that they're going to. With that, we've generated uh, packing slips. So essentially, each box will have specific information on the teacher's name, the school that they're moving from, and the school that they're moving to. So color-coded 
uh, uh, um, packing slips um, so that uh, the custodians clearly know that uh, certain materials and supplies are moving to a particular destination. We're not, we're encouraging teachers to pack as they go. Uh, so as they finish uh, teaching their September or October modules or curriculum, uh, they really have two decisions to make. What stays or what gets discarded because uh, in education, we are really, really good uh, at making sure our classrooms are museums of everything, uh, all the resources we've always used. Uh, so there's a decision to be made over uh, what they no longer need and a decision to be made on what they want to take with them. Um, we're not making them uh, pack at any particular time, uh, but certainly it's easier to pack as they go and for them to make the, the decision as to whether or not they're going to need certain materials or resources for uh, the rest of the academic year. Certainly workbooks and texts and, and certain materials are specific to uh, curriculum that we teach at a particular time of the year. So if we can move that material as we go, uh, that certainly is a goal. So they, they, may, they may begin packing, but um, you know, that will really be up to them and to the resources that they need. Our custodians will store and move those materials, as I said, sort of a, a holding facility. So uh, we may, um, as an interim, put some uh, materials on a school stage or a room, classroom, or part of the school that's not being used for instruction. And then at key points throughout the year, the news team may move them from school A to school B. Those key uh, times could be this uh, holiday break, could also be February break, our, our spring break in April, and of course, uh, over the summer. Uh, and lastly, uh, in terms of preparing to move, the principals uh, have visited and continue to visit their prospective school. Uh, principals, nurses, uh, secretaries have uh, spent um, a lot of time in their new schools. Uh, they have their uh, blueprint, uh, they have their safety plan, uh, they have met with the custodian of the other school, uh, trying to get away from the land and understand uh, all the intricacies of the schools that they'll be, uh, that they'll be leading. They've also continued to meet both formally and informally with the principal of the school that they'll be going to, uh, to understand some of the systems because our three elementary schools uh, were built in three different uh, three different times in our history, and they are three completely different schools. Furnace, Wood, or Furnace Woods is on a, on a cement pad, and the other schools are not. So there are some, um, there are some differences that happen, or, or um, there are some differences within the school that uh, you, know, you need to uh, spend some time and, and energy making sure you understand. In terms of staffing, uh, that is our next uh, major initiative. Uh, we are looking at our projected enrollment. <clears throat> projected enrollment by grade level will drive how many class sections we have and how many teachers we need. So uh, we have a board policy around class size. We have been uh, reviewing our current enrollment and moving our current enrollment into next year's model. So we have rolled over all of the kids we have in K-4 and have projected class size next year in the Princeton plan in grades one through five. We have a really good idea of how many students per grade level, how many teachers will need per grade level, and what the average class size will be. The unknown, of course, every year is kindergarten. Uh, kindergarten registration is going to start in late January. Uh, we have identified and confirmed about 120 kindergartners right now, uh, but <clears throat> the outreach will continue. Uh, in terms of orientation, kinder camp, all of those things uh, to make sure we try to identify as many uh, kids that will join us in, in kindergarten next year. Of course, there are families that are moving uh, into the district and moving out of the district, um, but kindergarten is, is always the unknown, uh, really until after school starts, uh, especially for families who uh, can't close on their home until after school starts or families who uh, forgot to register their children and they see the bus drive by a few times. So we have a really good handle on estimated staffing based on enrollment from our current K to fourth grade that will be uh, uh, that will be transitioned into the three schools by grade level. We also have uh, February 1st retirement notice. By February, the, the retirement notice is the last day of January, but February 1, we will know uh, with a pretty good level of certainty, uh, teachers that have indicated that they will retire at the end of the year. That also will drive, uh, it won't drive staffing, but it will drive a particular staff that will be with us next year. Uh, 
for uh, if we have certain teachers who retire at the elementary level, uh, we need to determine if they need to be replaced or not. Uh, but that will also um, help us identify the uh, our staffing needs uh, for next year. After those, um, after we meet those key milestones, then Margaret and Lisa and the elementary principals can start to determine which particular teacher will be teaching which particular grade level and in, and in which school. That's really important going back to the previous slide because now our teachers know where they're going. Not only where they're going by school, but where they will physically, what classroom they will be physically teaching out of. Uh, that's really important to know uh, so that the prospective principal can say, okay, this is my fourth grade wing, this is my fifth grade wing, so on and so forth. Uh, we can start to uh, build some schedules around collaboration and having teams within the grade level. Uh, and that's a really important thing that teachers want to know. They want to know what school they're going to, and then they want to know what their classroom is. And they will go and they will measure and they will make sure that their uh, their desks can be organized in certain ways or what uh, personal belongings uh, they may be able to bring in or where their reading centers will be or what they have their laptop cart. Um, that's a really big deal uh, because that's that's their second home. And for many people, it's their first home um, because we spend oftentimes more, more time in our schools and classrooms than not. Uh, and with that uh, is regular communication with our teachers. Um, the teachers union contract spells out very, very clearly the process for uh, moving teachers, what the priorities are in terms of uh, seniority and experience. And those are conversations that uh, we have been having with HHEA almost weekly uh, to make sure that uh, everyone understands what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that it complies uh, with, the, uh, with the contract language. Uh, with that, uh, we have been using uh, our early release days for our current staff to start meeting and planning with their colleagues in their prospective school. Uh, so we've had uh, a number of early release days so far this, this uh, young school year, we have many more coming and those have been dedicated at the elementary level to those teachers coming together to collaborate, uh, to talk about with their principal, what they want their environment to look like. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't happen often in public education that um, you get to really start over within the same district. And for our three principals, because they all are moving to three different buildings, and because they will no longer be a principal of a K-5, but two grade levels, uh, it's new to them and it's gonna be new to the teachers that end up moving. Every teacher, almost every teacher will have a new principal, but certainly will be in a new building. So they're having discussions around what they want their climate and culture to be, common language, what they value. Uh, certainly these conversations started with some icebreakers and getting to know each other and start to build that, um, build that family feel. Uh, with that, the three prospective schools, uh, Margaret and Lisa have set up opportunities for them to visit with other schools that are banded in similar fashion. Whether they're banded two grade levels at a time, uh, or a K-3 and a, and a four or five, or you name it. The idea is um, to learn as much as we can to plan in advance and identify some best practices and also some, some potential pitfalls to avoid. Uh, these meetings are, are with schools uh, not only in our backyard or in Westchester County, but as far as Western New York. Um, because uh, they are organized in similar fashion and, and we want to learn what works and what doesn't. We want to uh, accentuate the positive and make sure we avoid some things that they, that they have indicated we should avoid. With that, as we are focused on the future, these groups are also uh, very cognizant that they want to honor the past and they want to uh, make sure that each school um, gets a proper send off. Uh, so all of the principals are working with their PTAs uh, to honor uh, decades, half a century more, of a model that we've had in our district uh, that we're moving away from. So uh, they will uh, propose a, a series of uh, recommendations with their PTA. This will include ice cream socials, it will include bringing back alumni, it can include uh, open house with parents and barbecues, and everything is on the table right now because they want to make sure that uh, we're not just 100% focused on next year, but they have to take a moment to reflect this. That's really important to that group. 
Um, with that, uh, and partnering with the PTA, I'll speak in, in a little bit, our, our plans for students and parents. Opportunities for parents to get into the new school, see the classroom, understand the layout, uh, know where to park, know what the uh, pick up and drop off uh, uh, customs will be, and also meet their new principal. So part of uh, the time that the group is spending together in early release, day, release days uh, are to make sure that we have some operational um, uh, opportunities to uh, work with parents and, of course, students on the operations end. Uh, and also this group uh, is proposing making sure they have time to come together as a new faculty in the summer. Again, to continue the work uh, that they've begun during early release days, uh, because in the summer is when it's real. People are going to be moved in, they're going to be ready to go, uh, and then we start focusing on opening day. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have fallen into a routine of having staff come back at, at least two days before we open school, uh, right after uh, Labor Day, we may need to make adjustments to that calendar to provide some more time uh, for the elementary folks to come together to make sure uh, all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Uh, one of the big uh, ticket items that I know parents are interested in is transportation. And I know we've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, start and end times for the three schools next year will remain unchanged. All right. Furnace Woods will start and end a little bit earlier, uh, the school for fourth and fifth grade. That will be a huge uh, relief to some families that have, will have a student going to Furnace Woods and have a student going to any of the other elementary schools uh, because that bus will come a little bit earlier. Our policy is that students, uh, at least in fourth and fifth grade, can wait for the bus by themselves and be dropped off by themselves. So we're trying to demonstrate a little bit uh, a little more independence. Furnace Woods, so the fourth, uh, fourth and fifth graders, will have their own bus. What that means is uh, the buses will travel the district for that uh, Furnace Woods pickup and drop off separately. So that bus will only have fourth and fifth grade students on it, all right? Which means the buses for Frank D and VB, K1 and 2, 3, will only have kindergartners through third graders on it, all right? So there will not be buses with kindergartners and fourth or fifth graders, um, they, will be, they will be separate now because they're going to separate schools. So uh, we will have a bus run that will pick up students throughout the district that will go to Frank G and BB in the morning. Uh, and in the afternoon, those buses will be separate. So there'll be a group of buses that will pick up our kindergartners and first graders at uh, Frank G and they will send them home. There will be buses that pick up our second and third graders at BB and send those kids home. As opposed to in the morning, if uh, uh, where I live, um, you could have kindergartners and third graders on the bus that would uh, drop kids off at, at Frank G and then the BV or vice versa. In the afternoon, they are on a um, they're on a direct flight home. So afternoon bus rides will be shorter than morning bus rides, which lead us to bus rides. Um, the estimated bus rides right now are under. Uh, or, or we're looking to make sure bus rides are under 40 minutes. There are some uh, outliers and Liz and the transportation team are uh, going to look at those outliers in uh, mid January uh, and propose uh, some alternatives. And that could be vans or small buses uh, that will pick up uh, rather than you know, 40 or 50 kids on a bus, it will pick up a dozen. Uh, of students that live in some of the corners of our district and will be able to get those kids to school uh, much quicker. So our goal is 40 minutes uh, and every route that our computer system generates over 40 minutes is going to be um, adjusted if possible. And lastly, um, this is important as well. Almost all of our children will have a new bus stop because their bus is going to a different destination and may pick them up and drop them off at a different time. We heard last year uh, concerns that bus rides might be an hour or an hour and 20 minutes, and, and that, that is not the case and won't be the case. However, the fewer bus stops that we have, the more the, the quicker and more efficient our bus ride is. So um, part of planning uh, the logistics of picking kids up and dropping them off uh, at school is to try to condense bus stops so we have fewer opportunities to stop and go um, so that the bus ride can be quicker. Now, that does not mean that students who live on Albany Coast Road are gonna be crossing that road or walking down Watch Hill without a sidewalk. 
That is not what that means. What it does mean is that in certain neighborhoods that have very low traffic or that are uh, that our neighborhoods and not cut throughs, um, students may have to walk down a couple driveways to to get in a, a stop or get on the bus with other kids, rather than uh, some of the benefits we've been able to afford, where uh, every child has their own stop at the end of the driveway. So those will be evaluated as well. That's uh, was this project in January. And lastly, supporting parents. Uh, we worked with our elementary PTAs uh, to send out a survey uh, to elementary parents. And I hope that uh, our elementary parents take the time to respond to that survey. That survey was, was completely authored by the PTAs. Uh, what we had said was, here's the information we want to know from parents so we can plan some uh, FAQs, some Q&A sessions, and identify some resources uh, to support parents if they have questions or concerns about transitions or how we support students moving from school A to school B. Uh, so the PTA sent out that survey. Uh, we have well over a thousand elementary parents. Uh, about a week ago, I believe the elementary PTAs received 87 surveys. Uh, so we want to make sure that parents take the time to complete it. It's an open-ended survey. It is not a point and click. It is not pre-slug. Um, so it is, you know, for, for uh, a parent taking the survey, you know, we need, we need a little detail from them, uh, and maybe that's why we have a low response rate, but we did not want to uh, have the appearance of leading anyone's responses, you know, by having them check something. We wanted them to be able to uh, input it themselves, but uh, we, we have a pretty low response rate. I, I know it's the holidays and everyone's going a little crazy, but uh, that feedback uh, will help drive uh, some of our initiatives to uh, to help parents and do some more outreach with them after the new year. So I, I hope that uh, I hope that they can do that. I think the survey closes next week. It's it, it's been out for um, almost a month now. Um, and part of uh, what we'll do with that, depending on what the, the feedback or input includes, uh, is being uh, being able to line up parents with other parents um, that are in the grade level uh, grade band at school. Uh, I know that uh, talking to one of our principals, uh, or I'm sorry, talking to some of the PTAs today, uh, the PTA leaders have been meeting together to talk about how they will organize next year. And they have been meeting with PTAs in other grade banded schools. And the conversation always gets to, well, what's your experience and what do you think and so on and so forth. And, uh, so there've been a lot of really good organic discussions of other parents who are in this model talking to ours and uh, giving them some, some uh, very uh, direct feedback and, and suggestions. Um, so we want to continue that. We want to continue to partner with other schools. As I said earlier, Margaret and Lisa have reached out to, to schools across the state that are organized uh, by grade level. Uh, we may go back to them and ask them if, if our parents can speak to some of their parents because, um, you know, uh, as we're concerned, or as a, as a parent is concerned of, of a child going from school A to school B and eventually school C, uh, there are schools who have perfected that uh, model and perfected that support who have, been, who have been in that model as long as we have been in ours. So the whole idea is, is to uh, identify some best practice and, and find folks who live it every day uh, to give not only our teachers and our leaders, but certainly our parents some suggestions. So our next steps, uh, one of the board goals this year uh, was to make sure we have uh, this, this conversation uh, and updates at a board meeting. So we'll come back in January. Uh, we'll have some, uh, sure we'll have some, some news in terms of what class sizes will look like, number of teachers per section uh, in January. We'll give you an update on the move uh, and we'll give you an update on some of the priorities that came from the uh, PTA survey and what our plans are to uh, address uh, some of the questions and concerns that uh, that come from that uh, that document. Thank you, Bill. Um, do you have any questions from the board trustees? Yes, Alex. Do you have any idea how Mother Connection is going to work? That's a really good question. Um, we don't know. I know that they are working with the Westchester Child Care Council, which is their accreditation. They may need to uh, fill out paperwork to be organized a little bit differently. 
because I think they're credential to have certain uh, uh, a wider span of students from ages five to ten or, or K to five. I know when I spoke with uh, with their director a couple of weeks ago, uh, she and her board were going were, were actually going through the decision making process of how they wanted to be organized. We told them um, that if they chose to organize. Uh, have a K-5 program in all three of the schools, we may be able to support transportation. The iffy piece is what happens at Furnace Woods because Furnace Woods instruction starts early. Uh, but uh, that is, uh, you know, we will, we will continue to provide them space, but I don't know how they'll organize themselves or staff it. But it, so it's on the radar. Okay. Yes. And because it, it's a priority and it's a, for, for many families, that's the only way they can make it Make you know the before and after school care are a priority. So as long as it's on our radar screen, so we can make it happen for families. Yeah. Thank you. Joe, you mentioned that the bus routes were going to be uh, two schools deliver, you know, delivering the students at the same time to both the K through three, but then on the way home, it'll be two separate bus runs individual for each school. What is the cause or rationale of that? Because you think what's efficient for one would be efficient for the other. So I'm just curious, what's, what's the rationale or the cause for that? Um, the rationale is when the buses leave the furnace woods drop off, they can begin the pickup uh, for the two other schools. So the buses that drop off at furnace woods are already on the eastern part of our district, they'll start picking up the, the K through three. Um, so you don't have two buses going through the same neighborhood to pick up K1 only and then two, three. So we have a little more efficiency with our buses in the morning. Um, and if we have 40 children on a bus coming from the eastern part of our district near the middle school, let's say, they would, depending on the route, <laughs> depending on the, uh, the logistics or, or what the uh, computer system suggests, they may drop off the, the K1 at Frank G first and then drive five more minutes and do the two, three, or vice versa. On the way home, um, it was quicker to get the kids home directly from the school and not do that switch, not do uh, 10 buses leaving Frank G and going to BB and vice versa. Um, because usually putting kids on the bus, especially that age, can take anywhere between 12 and 18 minutes. And so uh, the last thing we wanted was to have five and six year olds on a bus any longer than necessary, just waiting for more kids to get on. Also, it's, it's, it's quicker in terms of time because those buses we need um, for uh, athletics. So we, we've got to get those buses back to the yard uh, because we need some buses for after school programs, but, but those uh, drivers are also our custodians to finish their routines in the school uh, to wrap up the day. So, get, so getting off the bus is much quicker than putting kids on the bus in the afternoon. I'm glad we're gonna be able to do that because I know it was a priority for parents to get their kids home as early as possible for after school activities also. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know that this is necessarily a question, more of a, a statement or a concern. But on the way in, I assume that we're going to figure out a system so that the children are getting off at the correct locations and that we don't lose a little five-year-old getting off at BV and they should be at FDL. I don't I don't know that that should fall solely on the bus driver. Um, no, Liz, a lot to... yeah, Liz is on that. She she's uh, talked to her transportation friends and other districts that are organized this way. I, I I should have mentioned she's doing her best practice research as well. And um, I don't want to I don't want to speak for her. And I know she hasn't made a decision. She'll consult with the principals. But yeah, they'll have different like color coded tags, a laminated tag that you know is on their zipper or or uh, some way to identify them what school they go to in the morning. Or what stuff that they get off that? Absolutely. Okay, got it. Thank you. I was just wondering, Joe, what the plans were for um, 
meetings with parents um, to help inform them of, of these changes and to provide an opportunity to ask questions as well. Yeah, uh, in, in working with the elementary PTAs, this was a, a discussion we started with them in the spring, we visited in the summer, and then put the um, came together in mid October for the survey. Uh, we agreed that we would let that, that survey drive the interest, and then we would plan meetings either at the elementary schools. Uh, virtually, I guess, right now, um, to do Q&As or also produce FAQs and save the time we spend with each other to do a Q&A or address some of their concerns. So uh, we, we know what the interests or some of the concerns were last year. We want to compare that to see if that's still a priority this year, but we're going to use those survey results. That is why uh, it was important on the, on the PTA. The PTA believed it was important um, for that survey to be open ended um, so that any and all concerns can be voiced and not just directed, you know, or, or, or pushed so we could have a faster analysis. But that will drive the content of what those discussions are. And, you know, there'll be questions around special ed or curriculum instruction, transportation. And like we did last year, we'll have our, um, our department leaders there to be able to articulate uh, the vision. Jen, do you have any questions? No, I think we'll start. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Joe. Okay, uh, the next update is uh, under superintendent's work is building use by outside agencies. This has been uh, this has been a, a discussion with uh, that we have been having with our outside agencies, and certainly we have uh, received and fielded a few questions. Um, I'll start this discussion by going all the way back to September, the, uh, I guess the executive order that the Department of Health placed on school districts, that everyone in the school district, uh, teacher, staff member, student and visitors must be masked, must adhere to social distancing, all of those things. Last year, we essentially shut our schools to outside agencies for a number of reasons. One, um, we didn't have, we, we, we had very strict uh, cleaning protocols. Our middle school and high school, those two schools are used the most, um, were operating in a hybrid model where it was really important that uh, kids came two days at a time and that we thoroughly cleaned uh, all the instructional spaces. Um, and we were not in a position last year uh, to add to our, our costs, our labor costs, by having custodians work overtime, additional cleaning, those sort of things. This year, uh, we wanted to uh, provide the opportunity for agencies to use our facilities within reason. So that includes the town of Cortland, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. Um, you guys know who, who we approved because it's an action of the board. Uh, in order for us to move forward, recommending to the board that they use our facilities, our facilities team um, either meets or has a discussion with those agencies and says, look, these are the rules of the school that are that are upon us by the Department of Health. And you have to assure us that you will follow these, these rules or enforce them. Otherwise, we can't have you in our facilities for all the reasons I just mentioned. So um, oftentimes, while that conversation starts with us, because we are responsible and accountable to make sure that any visitor uh, that we lend our space to is following those, sometimes there's an agreement between us and I'll use the town of, town of Portland, for example. Uh, town of Portland and youth basketball, it was agreed that only students would enter the school for purposes of practice and that adults wouldn't. Why was that agreed to? That was agreed to to make sure that we didn't have parents, not by not by choice, but maybe by mistake or happenstance, wandering around the school, uh, not being in the right place at the right time. Uh, also, trying to limit the the exposure or location of where uh, where the agencies are using our facilities to make sure Anthony doesn't have to tell his custodians to go back through and clean everything again or incur overtime costs. The other reason is safety and security. Before the pandemic, and I know it feels like decades ago, this the Board of Education in our community supported an $18.5 million uh, capital project 
the vast majority of which were around safety and security measures in our facilities. So much so that at that time, the board uh, moved its board meetings to, to the lower level of the district office um, to make sure we had a single point of entry, to make sure um, that folks coming to a board meeting couldn't leave and meander around the building for safety and security reasons. So uh, when we approve an outside agency using our facilities, there is a negotiation because we need to be sure that they will be able to manage and implement those mandates. The other piece is contact tracing. If someone were to test positive, the school district is responsible and accountable to coordinate or participate in contact tracing. And if we can't assure or have, uh, if we don't have an idea, or let's say the town of Cortland doesn't have assurances of who is in our facility and who is not, and at what time, uh, that's a health risk. And so those are some, those are some uh, very significant mitigating factors and layers that go into uh, our thing. Uh, we haven't denied anybody, but we have said to them that they have to be able to enforce this and ensure that they, they can account for people who are in our facility, they'd be able to account for contact tracing, they would be able to enforce uh, and supervise adults or children, making sure that they follow the proper health mandates. So I know there were some questions about who makes that determination and who doesn't. Um, we make the determination because there are facilities and those decisions are driven by the Department of Health Mandates. So I wanted to make sure we. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions about outside agency use of our facilities? Do you have anything else? No, I'll. Uh, anything else, folks? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to Andy, who is going to do our presentation on the um, performance, energy performance contract. So I want to um, set this up to, to, it's not as much a reminder for the board as it is the community who's with us and watching on TV and you may watch this again. Um, one of our cost savings measures initiated last year that the board asked us to look into is how can we streamline our operations costs? Um, we spend a lot of money uh, on the physical plant. Uh, Anthony will come back to us later in the winter with, with his budget, uh, and it will be very thorough how much we spend on gas, electricity, uh, all of those things. Uh, and so the board, as we were contemplating life after a deep coin and contemplating some very major decisions, the board said we need a you know we need a pathway to control some of our fixed costs. Um, fortunately for us, our district has routinely engaged in an energy performance contract. Uh, we're going to briefly tell you what that is and give you an update. But last spring, uh, the board asked us to to start to endeavor down this road. This is about a six month update because we uh, have begun that project. We wanted to let the board know where we are, but the community. Uh, especially. The reason is because we have an opportunity uh, under this energy performance contract to uh, guarantee savings in upwards of $3 million uh, over the next decade plus by making a strategic investment in some of our uh, district's infrastructure across our five schools. In order to do that, one of two things have to happen. The board will need to approve it because it basically is a multi-million dollar capital project that will guarantee savings down the road. And if we want our public to approve it with our uh, budget approval in May, we may we could receive an additional up to 10% funding from the state in order to incentivize us to invest in our infrastructure that will guarantee uh, lower fixed costs over the next decade. Uh, it's an incentive program uh, from New York State. School districts are encouraged um, are encouraged to uh, entertain this, uh, to go green, to be more efficient, and ultimately lower the burden on taxpayers uh, so that uh, we don't have increasing or ex uh, escalating fixed costs to operate the plant when we may have an opportunity to reduce them by investing in some of our infrastructure. So um, I know the board is well versed in it. Uh, majority of our board were here last May. I know uh, Jen, one of our new board members, sits on our facilities committee that talked about this 
uh, in some pretty good detail last month. Uh, but we want to make sure that the community understands because we may have an opportunity for the community to vote on this so we can receive a free 10% incentive uh, revenue in order to, uh, uh, to experience more savings uh, and to reduce the burden on taxpayers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony. You can walk us through, uh, give us an overview of what this is and walk us through some of the financial calculations and then we'll, uh, we'll tell you next steps and have a Q&A. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Tony said, we'll the, the discuss this back in May uh, as Brian for the performance contract, EPC for short, not for the um, uh, picture up the speed. We went out to several firms to solicit uh, bids for them to come back to us. What they thought would be some energy saving measures, what they, what they found in the buildings, and what they thought would we can incentivize and we can cover our utility costs. Uh, two firms came back to us. They gave us uh, their proposals. We had meetings with them. We sat down with them, uh, went over everything that they had. And we determined that the best of the two that we liked was day automation. So we're carrying forward with day automation. Um, I think a while ago, we got to prove about our intent to carry out day automation. So that's where we are now. So right now, our day automation is going to go. I'm just going to go through a couple of these slides and bring up the speed a little bit about what an energy performance contract is, uh, where we are in the scheme of things, and where we'll progress over the next several months. Right, so, this is an alternative uh, means of finding uh, building uh, improvements at no cost or now outlaying the back to the district. And the way it gets retained is through those savings, and those savings are guaranteed. So, we upgrade equipment and building environments inside the building. Uh, Expands uh, the amount of work done in the district. We can do a lot of different things. Coordination with our capital project plan. So we can align this with some of our capital improvements that we want to do uh, throughout the district. Uh, and some of those things that we can do are some, you know, lighting upgrades, HVAC upgrades, ventilation things of that nature, and efficiencies in the building, which will improve the environment of the building, but at the same time uh, save on utility costs. So it checks both those boxes. So that's how we align it with the capital project plan and we can take some of those things. Um, it's paid from existing budget operating funds. And there's no bond, as uh, Joe was saying before. And then we have the option to vote that after 10% aid um, qualifies for energy uh, incentives. So there's other incentives that we can get sometimes for some of these other agencies that are out there. And, or you know, day automation, we'll see if there's anything that can say solar rebates, if there's any electrical rebates, and things like that. We can also tie in with this. Um, and qualified to state building. Uh, the performances and savings are guaranteed. And what that means is that every year they do a, a measures and values, and they come through the building, and the company comes back to the after all the measures are in place, and they uh, do a report. They check our data and they go over our utility costs, what they were the year before, and they data log over where they are now. And so they go through that and they make sure that they are saving us those values and they are saving money through all that. And they do all that and write up a report at the end. So they're guaranteed that they have to do that. It's one of the criteria that you want to make sure. So, current status and timeline. Uh, day automation, uh, I meet with them. I just had a meeting with them again today. To review and identify energy um, saving measures, we went over a couple of different things, and every time we speak, we find something else, so we come up with a different idea. Um, and currently, they're going through the buildings, uh, performing their energy audit. So they're going through and they're looking at uh, lighting, they're looking at what potential for lighting upgrades we have. Um, I asked them to look at ventilation. Um, if you remember, we had some issues with our BMS at the beginning of the school year. So they're looking at upgrading the BMS, which is the building management system. The building management system controls our ventilation, controls our heating, controls our cooling, and things that are exhausting and things of that nature inside the building. Uh, we're looking to move to a more efficient platform within the Andover system. So we're going to evaluate that and see how we can move from one to better 
the newer version. The last version we had is back from when we did the original energy form contract, and beyond that, which is back in 2009. Something more of a web based product. Um, the energy audit is like you see, if you watch the timeline, you see 1222. We'll do it now. Um, next month, we'll be reviewing the scope of the architecture of engineering firm. Um, and then sometime in March, the AE firm will design. Um, and at the same time, simultaneously, we'll be recommending measures and meetings. And we'll be going over the submissions and uh, documentation that we have to send up to SED for verification. <clears throat> the SED will review it sometime in June, and we're looking to do our construction. Um, this is saying February of next year, actually 2023. We have the ability to do some of this work during the school year. Uh, because there's some of these lighting upgrades and there's ventilation upgrades, and some of these things to be done in no work second shift. We're coming after hours. We did it before with our last energy performance contract where the contractor came the night. He would select a couple of rooms, they would do what they have to do, clean up, and everything would be ready for the next morning when the staff and students return to the building. And it seems seamless that uh, we'll be able to wear it in the except when you come in, you have to, uh, newer, brighter lights, so you would visually see it. But in terms of the rest of it, you wouldn't realize that we were there. So we've been able to do that in the past. Um, I think they pushed out the construction far. Uh, we can do a third party review. We did that one time before, which sped up the SED approval process. So, we're also going to look at that. And that cost gets tied into the um, cost of this into this. So, it's all built into that. So, we don't have to pay on the outside for the third party. It's all built into the, um, the energy performance contract. So, um, but that is a measure that we've had to use in the past. It was effective. Um, and we'll see into that. And if, if SED gets more staff, it can also may push up the timeline for approval process as well. So right now, I think they have a conservative uh, February. <clears throat> so some of the energy conservative uh, conservation measures, and I touched on a little bit of uh, lighting. We're looking to upgrade the classroom <coughs> and the exterior and the building and the interior of the building to LED. Um, when we did the last energy performance contract, we went from T12 volts to T8 volts. We increased our savings and cut our electrical bill drastically. Um, we've done some LED lighting upgrades throughout the district already, um, and we were able to save money with those as well. So I'm optimistic for converting over the LED that this would be a great savings, and the LED technology is coming a long way from what it was back when back to the early years. Um, they're going to do a couple mock-up classrooms with the lighting. So this way it's not just paying and this is what we did. You know, you know, this is what you get. No, they're going to come in and do a couple of classrooms. I'll sit down with them, pick up a couple of classrooms. I think we're going to do something maybe up in the mountain. And I think it's something in DV or something of that nature. So that um, we can see it um, and we can decide, yeah, you may, what you like, what you don't like. And then, you know, it's not just. Back. They're going to come through. They're going to vet all the problem, you know, vet all the pieces and the puzzle all the equipment and all that sort of Very nice. Um, lighting controls. We have occupants and sensors now in a lot of our rooms, um, but they're going to add more where we where we're missing, where they're failing, or we're going to look in um, <clears throat> also schemes for the classrooms as well, um, making sure that the light is casting in the right direction. It's getting enough light where it needs to be. We have a lot of peripherals now with uh, smart boards and things of that nature. Is there a way that the front of the room is maybe dim when we're using that so you can see the board better? Or is it how the light casts and things of that nature? So again, with that mock-up, we'll be able to look at that and also be able to And sometimes they can do some things with switching. So like if you have three or four different rows of lighting, they can put two on one switch, two on the other switch, depending on where it is, to change it up as well. So we're going to look at all those alternatives for lighting schemes. Building envelope, uh, used for weatherization, uh, the doors and the door seals to see if we have any cracks, where air can enter the building, or heat or cooling is leaving the building, coming into the building, um, air sealing, insulation of windows, 
I've asked them over a couple of buildings for windows to see to make sure that they have the right values on them and if there's an opportunity. Uh, windows will always have the same uh, rate of return as lighting, but it gets a larger rate of return on it. Uh, windows will always have the same return on it, so they have to look at everything. Uh, global management system with EMS, which I uh, talked about a little earlier. Uh, we're going to look at upgrading that as well. Um, to, uh, we have an aging control system. We've had some issues with it over the years. Uh, we'll look at um, adding demand control ventilation. Uh, we'll look at all these systems, even though they have either demand control ventilation, there's overrides, there's overrides on the damper controls and things like that. It's just a little far in the weeds, but um, there's all these different things that can override and can change depending on what's transpiring on that side. Uh, with the building management system, um, I can also check temperatures inside of the buildings from my desk so I can see what's transpiring inside of the classroom. We're looking at adding other um, uh, telemetry into the classroom where we can see other values inside of the classroom, which would give us an indication of how well or poorly the ventilation is working inside of the space or inside the building. So we can uh, view that from a desktop so that when we have issues inside the building where someone's complaining about the issue inside the building, you know, I can see it or my head historians can see it from my, from my desk and I can say, okay, I can see that there is definitely a problem on there and I can research it and come back and say. So it gives us another measure. And with the web-based uh, program, I can see it from home, I can see it uh, if I'm at a conference, wherever I am on the laptop, I can pull it up and I can yeah. Uh, mechanical system upgrades. We're looking at some rooftop units uh, with some replacement or some upgrades. We have some aging uh, units. We also have some aging pumps and other uh, instruments that we use for equipment inside of our buildings. So we're looking at that. Some ventilation improvements we're looking at, uh, changing the air pumps on the buildings. Um, I've asked them to specifically look at Blue Mountain Middle School. I know we've always had issues with the shoulder months there with the, um, the heat attenuation in the building, especially in the spring and the fall and the shoulder months, like I said, you'll get some stagnant air or you'll get some dead air inside the building. So we're looking to make some improvements there in the process. So I asked them to specifically look at that building. Again, it's a multi level building. If you get to the upper floors, you get more on the upper floors. So I know that's always been a concern of mine and a concern of the public and staff. So this is an opportunity. Um, steam traps, upgrades, and improvements are thanks to Lindsay. That building, the heating system runs on steam. So we have steam traps inside that building. So they're going to look at those as well. Making those more efficient, filling those out, and repairing those, and just make the system that much more efficient. Uh, electrical system upgrades, uh, motor efficiency, and uh, variable frequency drives. Um, helps on your power loads and things like that because it's ramping up the motors instead of just throwing on the motors all at once. Which takes a big draw in the system. So your electric and demand response demand costs go higher. So the more you can have variable frequency drive to ramp up those motors and turn them on and off at a slower speed outside of the wall. Um, renewable energy, we're looking at solar. I know we have the five buildings on solar already, but it's something we always try to look for another opportunity of where we can do some solar, where we can do battery storage, or anything like that. I don't know that we'll be able to do it in this program, but it's something that's out there, so we need to look a little at it. So, save the resource. <clears throat> Next slide shows a, an example of the financial data. And it gives you an idea of, you know, the you know, potential project size of 2.2 million. The, the payback is 18 years. Uh, with a district data on the side, shows you have about $460,000 in utility costs, 30% energy savings, building age 50%. And then it goes through the numbers on the right hand side. Your guaranteed annual energy savings about 145000 Grant incentives, 60000 And your project costs going 10000 Ongoing services, 10000 That would be the investments in value. Building age 95000 And your net benefit, $80,000. Next slide is like a, almost like a shoots and ladder slide or something. Um, but it gives you an idea of the timeline and the process that we would go through 
and the time frame that it takes. This is a generic one, so it gives you, uh, without pulling the dates off, it gives you an idea of how all these um, different things take this one. Uh, process development procurement, whether it's 10, a couple of weeks, SCG, kickoff meeting, and detailed energy order, another, let's say, eight weeks, and then finalize the project scope, maybe legal review, forward updates, project designs, mission to SCG, and this should be a cool, but you can see that that's your longest thing, about 14 weeks, and then that moves back and forth. Final SCG approval, beginning finances, construction and commissioning. About 10 to 12 months and guarantee and an ongoing partnership with your company that you select. So, kind of just goes through all the process. Um, some of the benefits, and I think we touched on a little bit. Uh, the lead capital project, of course, significant improvements to mechanical electrical systems, improved lighting and control. You have to upgrade our building management system, qualifies to aid and incentives. Turnkey installation, uh, no change orders because it's all done. These are guaranteed costs, these are guaranteed whatever. So if you take the change orders out of it, whatever the technical is going to be, that's what it is. If costs go up for them, there's some issues there. It's, that's the project, that's the cost they have to do with that. So one nice part about it is that they do it, they hire all the contractors, they're in control of all the contractors, they oversee the contractors, do the construction administration for the contractors. Um, they let us know what's going on. I can verify what's going on. We'll go out and feel, check on things, check on the progress. We have progress meetings. So we're still in control of everything, but it's kind of like they're responsible for it. They're getting done on top of our issues. Um, we can make corrective actions. We can voice our opinion. It's not like we won't have to say at that point. In time. We can still say, Go into that project meeting and say, Look, you're not meeting the milestones, and we're not happy with the way these workers are performing, or they're not cleaning up after themselves. We still have a little set of that, so it's not like we're down. Uh, the long term commitment to performance and guaranteed performance and savings through managing performance contract. And in the course of that other slide, we can kind of like, you know, where you're going to be when you're saving money through the utility performance. So, whatever you save on Electrical, whatever you say, gas, whatever you say, those things. Those things. Same with the utility costs. So I ran down there. So. Thank you. It's, it seems that one of the slides was missing in the presentation that we had here. So we'll be sure that it's on the um, four dots by tomorrow morning yeah. for anybody who wants to see that. Does anybody have any questions about the EPC? No. Reference to doing these before. How many has the district done long we've been here so far? They did only one in 2009. Okay. And that's used as the baseline. So in 2009, we did an energy performance contract that was guaranteed to save the X amount of dollars. This is our utility cost. When they come and do the next one, it sits on top of it. If they don't use this as our energy savings, they will, they're, they're, this one will sit on top of the, the old one. So the cost savings goes from here. It doesn't take, well, let's just say we're saving 20 and we say we'll save 80. They don't have to save us 60. They start to save 80 on top of the plan. And do you remember how big the dollar wise that part, that, heat, that energy performance contract was back I then? I don't want to say about two and a half, maybe two point two million. It's a similar size to yeah. what we're talking about now. So and would you say that was successful? Yeah. And that was also a community vote. And did we have a successful vote on that one to get the additional um, funding state aid? I'm not sure if we did the additional vote because I think with the timing of it, I don't think we have enough time to get the additional vote. So I think we told you it was the first one we were trying to get it done. We didn't have the time <coughs> to sequence it. Okay. So we just went out and four vote with that. Okay. So it's like uh, I think we've been talking about before and we're getting on the you know, going up and potentially going up. So um, what Joe was saying before is that we have the potential um, with any one closing and now to really do bigger energy performance contract and to get more cost savings or more cost benefit, I should say, 
because if we go to a 10% building age to like a 30 or 40% building age, that's going to increase the size of the project and the scope of the project. So if we get 30 or 40, then we add another 10 on top of that, we're now at like 40, 50 percent. So it really becomes a nice size project to get that at 10 percent. So that's why we're trying to get ahead of it now. And we're trying to get the public as and you guys as much information as you can so we can work this way. Thank you. I was just wondering, Anthony, where we are on the whole shoots and ladders chart right about now. Are we are we doing the um, until energy audit still? Or are we doing the project scope at this point? Where, where are we? We're still in the midst of the uh, detailed energy work. Okay. And then the other question I had was. Um, do like electric buses qualify for anything like this, or is that it's only facilities? Yeah, it's only facilities. I think that's uh, you know, something on the outside, and I know we can't have those that are going into because there are plants and things of that nature for that. There's a lot of push to get school districts to try to you know, involve in that electric bus process. So, yeah, they're looking at the but that's not like this. this is just facilities. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Um, and then the other question, maybe this is for Joe. Um, no, okay. um, I mean, maybe you can tell me if it is or not. I guess uh, just I was just wondering what that vote on the ten percent would look like. Would that be you know the public pros? Is the amount of money that they're approving, or is it just to, to go forward with this, or? Well, I don't want to speak at a school, so you know, whatever. Um, but I believe we're doing EPC for money, mm -hmm. and then we're allowing the public to vote for the 10 percent. So, whether we get that or not, it's still going to be EPC. So, they're not voting to approve a certain amount of money, then they're just they're approving that we can if they approve the 10, we're, we're going to do larger scale projects. Right. Does that make sense? 10 percent of what? The additional 10% of the 2.2? Well, to, yeah. So I guess it works with the total. Okay. So let's just say, yeah, the 2.2. So okay. if you're going to do, you know, you're going to do 30% more or 10% more, it's going to be able to put for that another $200,000. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So when the, sorry. Um, so at the end, when they present the options that are out there, mm -hmm. is it kind of like you would pick, you would pick and choose the the benefits that work best for our district? Like, the, you know, they come back and say we could do BMS, um, lighting, steam tracks. We could do all these, but you, the, you'll sit down with them and you'll pick and choose what best fits our district's needs at right. that. Right, and this, and um, like I was saying earlier, there's certain measures that have better. Uh, made a return on so lighting right off that that's like one of the things that drives the whole project okay so without the lighting we probably wouldn't be able to do a lot of the other things we're going to be doing that but all the little all the small ones let's just say we had a, um, a rooftop unit um, at one of the buildings and he's like yeah it's really not going to be a return but i can squeeze that and it's almost like you know you're watching these things and you can pick you can have this you can have this, and this will give you this, and this will give you that, you know. And with this, you, you'll be able to look at and see which one's more effective, number one, which one's going to be easier for me to do by having an outside contract to do it. And I won't be able to, and then the other ones I can do out of my capital, my budget. You know what I mean? So it, it just works out better having them do it because they have control over it. We're doing this anyway, it fits better into this. And you know, that one, I'll just do it. So when the when I guess when the community goes on the ten percent, I mean I are we going to present to them what they're getting for that ten percent? I guess we get this extra ten percent. If you vote yes to this ten percent, we're going to get yeah. a BMS system, which we wouldn't. Yeah, find. correct. Okay. So basically, you have you have your baseline project, <laughs> assuming that we would never put it up for vote, or assuming that that we wouldn't get the ten percent, and then then. The plus ten percent are the all the additional things we can get by uh, riding along that resolution with the uh, general budget plan. All right. Yeah. So I just wanted. To... Okay. Thank you.
that proposition, it would be a separate proposition for the full 2.2 or whatever the full amount of that project is. They're not voting on a 220,000, a 10%. They're voting on the 2.2 million. Correct, because we could, do the, we could do the project on our own. We could ask the public to approve the additional 10%. If they do, that's great. If they don't, we can still do the original project without that 10%. Anybody else have questions? All right, thank you, Anthony. If, if uh, you guys will allow me, I would like to slightly alter the agenda and just have the facilities committee do their report now since we have Anthony with us in case they're making this up. Thank you. Facilities had a meeting a couple weeks ago. Is there anything else you wanted to tell us? Or just wanted to be sure with the ladies. Uh, we did meet, I think we mentioned under the previous board meeting, that we knew that a presentation was coming up, I think on January 5th, um, our next board meeting, um, and it's going to be back to see us again to present on um, all things facilities. Um, and I think it would be, you know, uh, better off to wait for that to know what's going on, because there's a lot of things in transition since, um, our committee meeting, which um, is a good thing that things are consistently moving, um, but I think the information on that meeting is somewhat outdated at this point. Uh, but that a lot of things were considered, you know, discussed in that meeting how things are going, uh, progressing with doors uh, for security reasons, you know, the security at the entrances, the uh, auditoriums, both at the middle school, high school, the BV, um, cafeteria, auditorium. Uh, a, a lot of things were discussed, but I think a lot of things have changed since that committee meeting. And uh, we should, the committee is gonna be meeting again before, we're, we haven't scheduled it yet, but we're in the process of scheduling it before that January 5th. So um, we can all be on the same page for the January 5th presentation. All right, that sounds great, thank you. We'll have things um, all right. Uh, so thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you. And that brings us to our first audience comment section, which is audience comments on the agenda items. Do you want to read your statement? Yes, yeah, so if someone's going to comment, then yes, we have one for audience comment. Okay, so because we feel community engagement is important, the Hender Hudson Board of Education welcomes public comment during this portion of the meeting. To maintain an orderly meeting, the board has allowed a 15 minutes for each public comments period, which may be extended by board consensus. Guidelines for those wishing to address the board are as follows. Each speaker should sign in with the district clerk prior to the public comment section and will be called in the order in which they have signed up. We would ask that groups designate one individual to speak on their behalf who is not permitted to cede your time to another speaker. When called, please step up to the podium and begin by stating the name and affiliation if applicable. Letters, petitions, or other written materials could be handed to the district clerk prior to your comments. All comments must be directed to the board. Each speaker is permitted three minutes for their comments and must be recognized by the board president. The board vice president, Lisa, will be timing comments and will give a 30 second warning to the speaker with a yellow card and indicate when the speaker's time is finished with a red card. The board may limit repetitive comments in order to give time to participants wishing to speak on varied topics as well as to maintain the efficiency. Although we take personnel concerns and individual student matters very seriously, the board is not permitted to address those in the concession as per state and federal privacy laws. So we would ask that we use appropriate administrative channels for these items. The board expects comments to be made without interference from the audience in a civil manner so that our meeting can serve as a model of appropriate civil discourse for our students. In the event the meeting becomes unruly, the board may need to recess the meeting until order can be restored. Please remember, if you prefer not to participate in the public comment section of the meeting, 
written comments to the Board of Education may be submitted in lieu of speaking. We do read all of those comments. Please see the agenda or the district website for contact information. We will now begin our public comment period on agenda items only. Our first speaker tonight is Stephanie Hickey. Oh, Ms. Hickey, I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to speak at the last meeting, but I am sorry. Um, I have a comment about the Princeton plan. I looked over the board docs, the presentation you have. I wanted to know, Mrs. Roller, maybe you can answer this. What we're going to use to measure the success. I know what model we have now. I know the cost and benefits of that model. Are we going to use test scores, maybe increase reading scores, increase math scores? Are we going to have more specials? Maybe a dual language program like Peekskill has with their Princeton plan? I, I just want to know how I'm going to measure it. Because I know the move looks to be a lot, and I see that you're on point with the move. It looks like you're very organized in the teachers. Maybe we even measure community and parent involvement. So I know another parent had the same concerns at another meeting that I was at. I would have liked to see that in the presentation. So we do have a definitive metric. So we, as a community, know that it was successful. And one more other thing about the survey. I'm on the strategic plan planning committee. I asked a couple of people for interviews for the survey. I got one person to interview. Here's the problem with your surveys. We never get the results. The Princeton plan survey, that was a Google form. Your results are populated in graph format. Where's the graph format for each question? Where's the Google sheet? All these surveys that you give the community we never see the results. So that's your low turnout for surveys. Why? I mean, I went to a couple people and said, can I interview you? And they're like, why? We never get to see it. You're not going to get the community to fill out surveys when we never see the results. I would like to see the Princeton plan survey that was given before the model was approved. I want to see those results. You have them. I would like to put in the board docs so the community can see it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hickey. There will be continued uh, presentations on the Princeton plan implementation going forward, as you know. And um, there is a plan presentation for strategic plan at the January 5th meeting. So can we get those results inside the board docs so the community can see it? It might make them actually fill out another survey so they see more happy to fill it out. Do they see what the results are? Thank you. Um, I just put a couple minutes to prepare. Unfortunately, this gentleman likes to be. Okay, that's fine. Step on up. Uh, my name is Chris Beagle. I'm a parent. I've lived here all my life. Um, I'm only speaking because I've heard the superintendent speak about the basketball, and that was a question of mine. Um, and it's ironic that I was here before talking about masks, and this is really the masks too, but the, the, the email that I just got to today referencing masks, coming to the meeting referencing title uh, NYCRR 2.60, it actually said for the last time that I was here that you didn't need to wear a mask while you were playing the wind instrument. Uh, part of that, that thing, but back to what the superintendent was talking about, uh, with the town and, and basketball within the schools and stuff, my, my, my question came up is, I, I already have security concerns that I've seen. I mean, uh, do, we have, do we have problems in the past with parents dropping their kids off at, 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 at local schools with great problems with securities? Because if, you, if you've been I'm actually wandering off and stuff, have you been to a Boy Scout um, a meeting compared to a basketball practice? At BB, because I'll tell you, at a Boy Scout meeting, there's kids wandering and, and, and people are everywhere. But if you're in a basketball practice, I mean, you're, you're confined to the gym, you just want to be there with your child and, and, and help them, I mean, with basketball, you know what I mean? To, to be there. I'm a single dad. I like to be there as a part of my kids as much as I can. But um, the, the, the question that came up to me that, that didn't make sense to me is that if you had a practice, I had to drop my son off at a practice. And let him go inside and then come back and pick him up later. So, I mean, that's just one team practicing in the gym that I couldn't be a part of. 
But it didn't make sense to me that three people could go to a game and, 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 and two teams are playing. So you have three times as many people there. And it just didn't make sense to me. So I was just looking for like some clarification or so I'm not looking for any answers because I, mean, I know that's not part of it and I don't want to give them time or, or whatever, but just wanted you to voice my opinion to see where I'm coming from. Um, but if it doesn't make sense, I got a question. Uh, and, and the mask thing, I get it. I mean, um, we, we all have to do masks. I mean, it's not just me and my family. I mean, you're looking out for the whole entire community and the schools and everything. I mean, I, I get it. But if it doesn't make sense, I mean, that's, I, I had a question. So some of the things that the superintendent brought up with the security, um, contact tracing, I mean, I even to contract trace them at, at, at game, going compared to practice and, and, and drop off. My whole issue was, was just dropping my son off and, and, and it didn't make sense to me. Like when there are one, five people, coach or whatever, and having the whole gym to ourselves compared to the game, it just didn't make sense. So. Anyway, that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I would suggest you speak with Mr. Hockard, I'm sure he would be happy to have a conversation with you in a little bit more depth. Yeah, no reason I'll speak. I wasn't going to speak tonight. I, I already kind of said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so that brings us, thank you. So that brings us to our committee reports. Are there any other committee reports for this week? Okay, do we have any board comments or any business? Um, I wanted to discuss with the board the possibility of um, bringing presentations of principals to the board meetings um, in light of the fact that many of us as parents have been in schools um, and know a lot of activities are still going on and it would be nice to share some of the um, the good things going on, such as the Blue Mountain Middle School um, music yesterday or last night. I, I think the high school is having chorus tonight. Just some of the activities that are still going on, and you know, also just talk to the principals of how kids are doing in school and you know, competing with COVID and um, still managing. So, just wanted your opinion on what you guys thought. Sure. Um... Lisa and I were talking today actually with Joe about scheduling a um, retreat in January so that we can discuss what kind of presentations we want in the spring going forward for you know the second half of the year and how we feel we're doing as a board and also make sure that we're on track with them this year. So that I think that would be a great time to discuss that. Um, and the rest of the board can think about that as well. I actually, um, I love that idea, Jen, because I know that a lot of times as community members, we're not connected to the people that are leading our, our buildings, but also as parents, we really only know the leader of our child's building. And I think it's great timing for something like this with Princeton plan happening because it would allow people to experience all of our wonderful principals and leaders. So it could be an awesome way to to just get a little insight on their style, who they are, and, and their- And their... we've certainly done that in the past. You know, pr prior to COVID, we would have students come in and do presentations, and the principals come in, and some of the teachers come in and do presentations. And unfortunately, the past year, we haven't been able to do that. And this fall so far, our atmosphere at our meetings have not really been conducive to having guest speakers in. Um, and I'm hoping that we can do more of that now. In the second half of the year. Yeah, I think it would bring positive, you know, positive yeah. to these meetings for sure. Yeah, I, I don't want this <laughs> Until we make a decision as a board, um, you can always attend a PTA meeting. I know every PTA meeting I've ever attended, they have a principal's report where they um, talk about what's going on in their building. So that's always a good way for parents just as a friendly reminder to connect with your, your school. And, and you don't have to be a member of that school to go to the PTA meeting either. They're generally open to any PTA member. So if you were, if you have an elementary school kid who's maybe fourth or fifth grade and going to the middle school, you could join their PTA and start going to middle school PTA meetings. And get the middle school is like, or the high school or whatever. Um, it's not really limited to that. But that is a great way to get updates. Thank you.
Okay, so I guess we'll talk about it during our retreat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that'll give everybody a chance to think about what kind of ideas they want to. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody else have any board comments or business? All right, so that brings us to our second audience comment section, which is our non agenda items. And the same rules apply as prior. I'm going to do that on the station again. Do you have any speakers? We do. And our first speaker is Mrs. Michelle Maranta. Thank you, Ms. Maranta. Hi, I'm Michelle Moranta. Uh, I am the mother of three children in the district, a senior, a sophomore, and a third grader. I did send a letter last week into the board, Mr. Hoffrader and Mr. Matkin, but I wanted to bring up and mention this evening. Um, this was in regards to Mrs. Barthamus's extended absence. Um, I'm sorry, we can't discuss personnel matters in the public. I'm not asking why she was out. I really want to know about the replacement and the lack of instruction that has happened uh, in her absence. Um, what I really want to know is what we're doing to fix this issue, um, why the sub position was not posted for about five weeks after her absence started. I'm sorry, these are all personnel issues and we can get someone in contact with you. Okay, well, I think the fact that we've had no teacher in these classes for two months is just unacceptable as a school district. I'm not asking for the whys, I'm asking for what we're doing to fix the problem. So how are our kids going to be educated in these classes? Continue. All right, Mr. Hopper. We have your contact info? Yes. Oh, and the uh, we don't accept that. Oh, the left, yeah, yeah, we have it already. <laughs> Do we have any other speakers? Mrs. Hickey, Stephanie Hickey, would like to have uh, not, not a not agenda. Not agenda. Not agenda. Good evening, Ms. Hickey. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting up here and I was here last week and I've been coming and I want to say that there's this adversarial, there's an adversarial relationship that you have with the community. And I don't really think that you know how bad it's really getting. And I tried to warn you about that a couple meetings ago. Last week, when someone spoke, I don't know the name of the man, and he spoke about the mask mandate. And he went, uh, the people who are watching at home, there were six people in the audience. He was back there. He was more than 12 feet away from you. It was at the end of the meeting. There was only, I think, two other people signed up to speak. You got up and you left. And then you left the administration here. And Mrs. Ruler, the administration was doing exactly what you were doing. They were, I cannot believe that I even have to listen to this. Why is this lady even talking? Mr. Catalan actually was laughing at the man when you yes. left. Excuse me, Ms. Hickey, you're making this very personal. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Specific okay, but I have a video of him because I was sitting in the audience. I won't say a name. An administrator was, you guys were over there. He was laughing at the man that was in the audience. He was going on. The other two administrators had left. I'm telling you, it was so, I'm, I'm speaking to you guys as human beings. It was wrong. I'm a teacher. Parents come to me and sometimes they say things that I completely disagree with. If I laughed in their face, I could be fired and put on dis disciplinary action. You, you know what? I learned something sitting at that meeting and I hope you guys learn it. Even if someone says something that you don't agree with, there's something in it that you can take away from it. You don't have to agree with it. There are things that the administration here says and that sometimes I just open my mind and it's okay. I, I learn something and I say, okay, that's why you're doing it. Some of the presentations you've done, I come in here with a closed mind and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I didn't think about it that way. But to be dismissive, disrespectful, laughing, your own code of conduct to the school students talks about how you want them to have tolerance for people. 
You're talking about in this meeting, you want to model to the students what they should be like. I don't see that. And I gotta tell you, I don't think you're doing it on purpose. I mean, no one would do this on purpose. Your board members are all looking at you, not the administration. And I can save you a ton of money on consulting fees. You don't have to hire another consultant. Fix the problem in this room, and it's not with you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Hickey. And thank you for being open minded when you come to the meetings. All right, so that brings us to the. Oh, do we have any more speakers? I think you said there was this one. We have no more speakers. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the end of our meeting. This is our last meeting for 2021. Next scheduled meeting is January 5th, uh, 2022. Have a good end of the year and a happy new year, and we will see you in January. Can I get a motion to close the meeting, please?